I want you to think about what you look at because that's going to be your future. I don't know if you know this, but your eyes actually focus on 50 different objects every second. That's crazy. The only organ more complex in your eye is actually the brain. And 80% of all learning comes through the eyes. And you actually see things upside down before your brain turns it right side up. But honestly, the best description of the eyes I've ever heard is this. The eyes are the groin of the face. Now, I know what you're thinking, what? But it's true. Just get poked in the eye, or better yet, might as well just poke yourself in the eye. If that doesn't work, do what I did. I remember one time I was like running up the hill by my house super fast. I was running up and I actually had a stick from a tree go right into my eye socket. Totally disgusting, I know, and I, I mean, I'm fine. I go see upside down in one eye, but that's okay, right? Or if you ever just like spend some time cutting up an onion, you realize maybe our eyes really are the groin of the face. All the work our eyes do take a fraction of a second, but it all controls so much of how we respond to the rest of the world. Like if our eyesight is bad, it's disorientating. Yeah, like our other senses get a little stronger, but that's because they have to compensate for a huge loss. No one would choose to lose sight. Now listen, we all know the first step to kidnapping anyone is to actually blindfold them, right? Lights turn off and immediately our brain and our other senses begin to scatter for whatever information it can get. If our eyesight is poor, it affects almost every other part of our bodies. I'll say it this way, when our vision is compromised, everything else is as well. It's again, here I am running full tilt in the dark. I'm at this campsite. And the only thing I remember is actually waking up from blacking out because I didn't see a clothesline that literally had just basically knocked me right out. Now the Bible, sometimes it can say, how can I say it? Some pretty intense, often confusing, sometimes shocking things like a bear coming out and eating kids. And, and Jesus isn't actually totally off the hook either. Like you hear things like him saying, would you drink my blood, eat my flesh? Or you hear things like what we're going to talk about tonight. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge them out and throw them away. Pretty gross. Now, there's obviously some context here. He's using extreme language to get across something very important. If there's something that is compromising holiness, it's better to cut it off than suffer death. Gangrene, for example. You cut it off before it infects the whole body. Why? Well, because it gives permission to the disease to actually ravage the rest of your body. It's why your mom tells you to stop hanging out with that one person because she knows that it's giving permission for their influence to change you. Now, this maybe makes a little bit more sense in light of something else Jesus said. And it was a little later on, but this is what he says. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness actually is. Is. That's found in Matthew chapter 6, 22 to 23. Again, when our vision is compromised, everything else is as well. What we choose to look at is like giving permission to either light or life or dark, death, to have its way in us. So we're either careful or you're like me, running full tilt in the dark, only end up on a stranger's lawn totally knocked out. If our eyes are set on things that bring life, like beauty, hope, Jesus, love, good, it's like giving permission for life to grow and life to flourish throughout the rest of your body. But if our eyes are set on death, things like hopelessness, comparison, maybe it's sin or your ego or it's pain, it's like giving permission for death to grow and infect the rest of our body, like gangrene. Let me ask, are you paying attention to what you're giving permission to? It's why when anyone is asking me how to deal with their sexual struggles, or maybe it's like their low self-esteem, their greed, or etc., one of the first questions I always ask is this, well, what are you watching? I ask, who are you following? What are you setting your sights on? Sweet, sweaty, perfect bodies make up your Instagram following. Well, maybe that's why you struggle with comparison or low self-esteem. Awesome, you struggle with porn, but yet, you keep your phone, your laptop, your big screen TV in your room all the time. Listen, that's not helping you out. What are you setting your eyes on? 
or you feel like you never have money, but it's probably because you follow people pretending they have endless amounts of money but don't work. What are you setting your sights on? Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Now, let's see the immediate context here, because I think it's going to help us process what this means for us today and means for us in general. So he's talking with these people who are setting their eyes on kind of gaining treasures here on earth where things are temporary, things are passing by, and he encourages them and challenges them, no, set your eyes on things in heaven that's eternal. It's things that are still to come. And they're wrestling with money and serving God. And he says, listen, you can only, only one of those things can master you. What's it going to be? Money, money, money. Must be funny in the rich man's world. See, he's resetting their value system. And when you and I follow Jesus, our eyes are not to be set on what is temporary and passing because then death wins. Saying if our eyes are set on what heaven celebrates, what heaven values and permeates, on what Jesus celebrates, what he values, what he permeates, well, death has no sting and life wins all day. What you set your sights on determines where you walk, how you grow, value, what you believe, and even what you become. Think about it. When was the last time you bought something? Didn't you notice how that was the main thing you noticed everywhere else? Jesus here is saying this. What you set your eyes on, what you look at on purpose, will determine your walk. It's going to determine your growth, determine your values, your beliefs, and your becoming. Now, listen, this whole series has been about one thing. You become what you purposely choose to become. So sleep with purpose, speak on purpose, think on purpose, and now look on purpose. Why? Here's a secret. Because becoming is never by accident. When we follow Jesus, we begin the process of learning what it means to speak like him, what it looks like to think like him, to sleep soundly like him. It's seeing what he sees. And this helps us recognize where we need his help and where we need him to kind of form things in us. So are you paying attention to what you're seeing? Are you paying attention to what you're giving permission to? Well, what does looking on purpose look like? Well, let's just start here. I'm gonna ask you this question. What do you look at as your ultimate value? Because what we value is what we set our eyes on and then invest into. It's how we shape our future. You walk and you grow based on where you're looking. So again, what do you value the most? Like if you value or you set your sights on pleasure, that's where you're gonna invest a lot of your time and your life into. If you value or set your eyes on riches, you're on health, that's where you're going to invest. Now, none of these things are actually bad in and of themselves where the problem lays in how we value those things. So Jesus' main question in this passage we looked at was that they were valuing earthly possessions and money as the ultimate goal. See, they set their eyes on things that will fade with age, circumstances, emotions, or others. They were giving permission for death to win. Are you? In contrast, the life Jesus is inviting us into is one where our lives are orientated around the personal presence of Jesus and his work in and around us. It means to reorientate our vision to seeing him in everything, everywhere, including especially what we value, because what we value determines how we end up living. It means we need to start with assessing what we value under the eyes of what or how God values it. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand, Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. That's found in Colossians chapter 3, 1 to 2. It's a, another New Testament letter written. So is it money? Now we know that he's generous and values generosity. Are you generous? Why are you wanting to be rich? Or maybe why do you want to live simply? How does Jesus value money? Does your bank account and spending habits reflect a heavenly mindset or an earthly mindset? Where are your eyes focusing? Maybe it's your health. Now listen, Jesus cares about your health, but he cares less about how you look. And thank the Lord, because honestly, COVID-19 has not been doing me any favors. He values us valuing our bodies and its ability to speak of God's incredible creation and its ability to work out God's actions through you in our world. Is that how you view your body? 
Is it how you view other people's bodies? What about what you watch? Is it neutral or is it enriching you or is it tying you to sin in greater ways? Is your watching habit screaming back to us how we're coping? Is it taking over you or, or are you in control? The arts, including entertainment, can be a way to see God's humor, his beauty, and powerful storytelling. Or it can be an escape, something that permeates our thinking and speaking to our detriment. Is it helping you see God or do you feel like it's got you hiding from him? What about your schedule? What does your schedule say about where your eyes are set on? Is your schedule in control or is it out of control? What do you prioritize? Are you looking at it as a way to ensure you're letting God speak to you and, and you to Him? Or are you living by the whims of your emotions, your circumstances? What is God asking from you or doing in you? Can you see that in your schedule? Are you prioritizing what God sees as valuable, like church community, the care of others, meeting with Him? Here's the thing. What you set your eyes on determines what you give permission to. Is your vision compromised? Now, the thing is that the choice is yours and it's mine every single day. So what will we, what will you set your eyes on? See, what difference would your life make if we chose to look on purpose? Because what you set your sights on determines where you walk, grow, what you value, believe, and even become. A compromised vision leads to a compromised life. Here's how I think we can help ourselves reset our vision every day. The first thing is this, scripture. This is where we learn how to see God and how he sees us, how he sees others and he sees the world. And it's when we read scripture that we tell the rest of our body that we prioritize his words in his life. And many of us don't notice God's work in us and around us because honestly, I think we seldom set our eyes on his words. And I think when we read the Bible, it helps us evaluate what we see. Second thing is begin to see everything as his furniture. Now, let me explain this. The world is like his living room. He set up where he wants it and it expresses his personality, his creativity, and his vastness. Let me ask you a question. Have you stopped to see who he is and what he may be doing in just the things around you? Romans 1 says this, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Though everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they've got no excuse for not knowing God. It encourages us to expect to see him. It forces us to look up from our screens to notice his handiwork all around us in nature. And I think it changes the way we view others and ourselves when we realize that, man, we're created in, in God's image. He made us wonderful. Three, that value, if it's super important to you, how does God see that value? How did Jesus value it? Are you emotionally drawn more by material things than by Christ? Fourth is community. Listen, you and I, we need help seeing right. We all do. So who are your people? Do they long to see Jesus? See, the common thread throughout Scripture is that God is found, known, and experienced in community. Do you have a community of people who are wanting to see what God sees? And wanting to recognize Him in all He does? Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. Build a community around that. Now listen, I know there's a few of you that are probably watching, maybe for the first time you're engaging this or you've been thinking about God. I want to encourage you, we think the best first step is really just taking him up on his offer is come follow me. You know what that looks like? It's beginning to read about him. It's beginning to maybe talk to him a little bit. And all that happens by just observing his life. And we made it really simple. What we ask people to do is just text the word next to 555-888. We're gonna send you a digital booklet. You can get an idea of kind of who Jesus is and, and kind of where to start the stuff out because honestly, this takes time. What we talked about today, what we talked about this whole month, I mean, it's about resetting and reorientating our life. That takes a long time. And we just think this is the best place to start. Take advantage of it and do that. But what I wanna to do to kind of end this night off is I actually love to just pray with you. Whether you're watching on Sunday night, you're watching in a different time, watching it alone, or maybe you're watching it digitally with some friends, do you mind if I just prayed with you? Why don't you bow your head, close your eyes, and let me pray. God, I thank you that you are with us and for us. That God, you did create us, you made us. You made our eyesight. You know, the Bible says that we are made uh, with such complexity, that we're wonderfully made. And Lord, I pray that you help us to see what you see. God, help us to see you, help us to see others and ourselves, help us to see creation. God, the way that you want us to do that. 
I pray that you help us to form our life around your life. And those, those kind of points in life that are kind of hard to, to make those adjustments, I pray for your grace to do that. For all of us, Jesus, help us to set our eyes on things that provide hope and peace, especially during what's going on. Some of us are really lonely. Some of us are hurting. Some of us are confused. Some of us are angry. But Jesus, as we set our eyes on you, I pray that we would sense your spirit and your life kind of infiltrating and permeating us. And God, that we would begin to give permission through our eyes for life to happen in us. God, we thank you that you're for us all the time. And God, our hope and our peace is in you. Amen. Guys, thanks so much, honestly, for watching every single week. We miss you. We love you all. We're praying for you constantly. And there's different things that are going on. We've got, you know, worship on Wednesday nights that we release. We got that Bible study. We do this. A lot of other things that we're doing. And we're just so thankful to be part of your life, be part of your spiritual development. And uh, we're just so excited to gather again um, when we can. But you know what? I just love the fact that we can at least do this and be together digitally. We love you. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next week. If you had an opportunity to actually sit down with God and ask him questions, what questions would you ask? You know, some of the most famous questions that are asked of God are like, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why did you put me here on this earth? But what would your questions actually be? In June, we're doing a brand new series called Questions for God, and that's the whole point of it. What questions would you ask God? Here's the thing that we want you to help us formulate this month. Because, I mean, we can pretend to know what questions you'd ask. But what if we actually knew what you wanted to ask? So here's the thing. You're going to find our Instagram pretty quickly. An opportunity for you to ask God questions. What questions would you ask him? We're going to use some of those questions and we're going to formulate a series in June that we're pretty pumped about. Maybe you've got friends in your life who don't know Jesus yet. This could be a great series for them. Maybe they've got questions. What questions would they ask? Maybe they ask you about God. We want to hear those questions, send them in, and we're really pumped for a new series called Questions for God starting in June. Yeah, let us know. What would you ask God if you had a chance to sit down with him?